Uh, this morning, of course, we are once again in the, the book of Philippians. So please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Stand with me. We're going to conclude this chapter today. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be, blessed, uh, may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Shall we pray? Lord, once again, our eyes, our, our thoughts are drawn toward your word, and it is our intent, our hope, to know what you have to speak to us uh, about today. Lord, give us ears to hear as we prepare our hearts now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Last week was Mother's Day, and the week before, we looked at Paul's relationship to Timothy in a study that I called a commendable minister. And today, we're going to look at Paul's relationship to Epaphroditus in a study I'm calling a consummate missionary, a consummate missionary, and meaning that Epaphroditus is really the perfect, the ideal, the supreme example of what a missionary uh, should look like. Uh, we actually know very little about Epaphroditus except that the meaning of his name. Uh, his name actually means favored of Aphrodite. Um, the name finds its roots really in the worship of Venus, who is what is the Roman equivalent to uh, Aphrodite, uh, though the name in Greek can also mean lovely or devoted or the grace or being graced by Aphrodite. Now, in following letters, uh, Paul the Apostle is going to speak of a young man by the name of Epaphras. He does so in Colossians and in Philemon. Epaphras is believed to be a shortened version uh, and a more Christianized version of the name Epaphrodites. Uh, Epaphroditus, I mean. Uh, Epaphras simply means favored or graced or devoted. And so we have half the name represented in Epaphras, and so we believe that Epaphroditus probably had two names, his given name, which of course came to him through his parents, and the other uh, name, his chosen or converted name, if you want to call it that, which he might have chosen for himself or perhaps his dear Christian friends may have given it to him, similar to where the name Barnabas came from. His name was Joseph, but he was such an encouraging fellow, they just decided to call him son of encouragement, which is what Barnabas means. And so it's very possible that they dropped the uh, Aphrodite part of his name simply to uh, let him know we love you and you're a part of it. And he went, actually, it could have been something, a nickname that actually indicated the change that had occurred in his life. And so he went from being devoted or graced by Venus to being devoted or graced by Christ. And so he apparently took that name wanting to distance himself from his old life and his old identity, something that all of us should be concerned about, distancing ourselves from the old life and the old identity. And there comes a point in every believer's life when we're going to be confronted with a decision on whether or not we want to be identified with Christ and how far we want to be identified with Christ. And for many, this decision, this, this departure, if you will, will involve also a departure very often from the influence that our parents had over our lives. 
There already is a marital departure that occurs in every married couple's life, as the scripture says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and that's for the purpose of marriage. The parental influence subsides and starts to to disappear as a couple starts to develop in their own personal relationship. And so there is a a separation from parental influence. But even before the the marital departure, there may also be a personal, perhaps a spiritual departure. And what I mean by that is, is this is what happens when we choose to leave the old life behind in order to follow the new life, in order to follow Christ. We start to leave that life. It's a departure. And if your parents dedicated you to Aphrodite, then they would have probably raised you in the belief system of Aphrodite. And when you come to Christ, you begin to leave that belief system. You abandon that belief system in order to follow Christ's teaching because ultimately you realize it's not right to try and live both lives. Perhaps your parents were atheists. You were raised without a conviction of God whatsoever. Or perhaps your parents were Jewish or Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or Masons or Lutherans or legalists or evolutionists or alcoholics or drug addicts or racists. And you come to Christ. Your life intersected with Jesus and suddenly a new pathway, a new way of thinking was discovered and your life began to change and it began to change forever. At least it's supposed to. It's supposed to. I remember the night that that my upbringing collided with Jesus. That was a shock. My path crossed his path in a very small church in California when Jesus spoke directly to my heart. Interestingly enough, though, he didn't tell me to convert. He didn't tell me to leave my family upbringing. He didn't tell me to leave the religion or belief systems of my childhood. He simply said, learn of me. There's another path. I want you to take it and follow me on it. And that's exactly what I did. I became a follower of Jesus Christ that night. And as I followed him, he changed me, and he changed me permanently. He changed me deeply. He changed me from the inside out, and I went from from being an Epaphroditus to being an Epaphras, and he, he seamlessly replaced my belief system, and I didn't even know it was happening. He changed everything inside of me, so much so that my family and friends would say, Who are you? I don't know you anymore. You've become someone so different. That's supposed to happen in the Christian's life. If you've had a genuine conversion, that's supposed to happen. Now, some of you may find yourself at this intersection today, and I advise you then, listen for the Lord. Listen to what he has to say, because he's going to deliver you some great instructions for your life. So as we come to this story of Epaphras, or this little bit on Epaphras, what can we learn about him? What does the Apostle Paul say about him? First of all, Paul said, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, in verse 25. So Epaphroditus, we do know from this, that he was sent from his home church And he was sent to deliver very much needed need, financial aid, for the Apostle Paul in this crisis he finds himself, and to assist the Apostle Paul in whatever way he could during this difficult time that Paul finds himself in. Remember, he's in prison. And in prison, he had needs that the prison system wasn't going to take care of, and so the church was taking care of it. But Epaphroditus becomes seriously ill, and now... He actually needed to return home to recover and to ease the great concerns of his sending church. Now, if you're taking notes, Paul says five things about Epaphroditus that I want to cover here that will tell us exactly how the Apostle Paul felt about this good man and why he thought Epaphroditus was a consummate missionary. And first of all, we see he calls him a brother, Adelphos. This is really a remarkable claim by the, by the Jewish Apostle Paul. 
Paul, a Jew, believed that a Gentile with a heathen pagan background was his brother. That's amazing. Racism out the door, prejudices, shot. And that's supposed to happen in the Christian church. It's supposed to be that way. That only the Christian church can such a thing happen in this way and be considered genuine. There are many clubs that we have in our country, many fraternities, affiliations, and, and in many of these types of places, they refer to their members as brothers or sisters. But it's mostly, I would say, maybe emotional, perhaps a sentimental connection that they have with a particular group of people. Not that it's not real. It certainly is real that members feel this connection with one another. But in the church, we are all actually related by blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the only requirement for membership. And so we are, of course, brothers and we are sisters. Now, the reality of the blood of Christ causes us to start thinking differently toward one another. As the apostle said to the Galatians, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of believers. There is, of course, uh, we're supposed to treat all men equally. We're supposed to treat all men with kindness and goodness across the board. But we're to be especially good to Christians treating them uh, with utmost respect as brothers, as uh, sisters. So we're given permission to play favorites, Christian nepotism of sorts. We can show such favoritism. And if you don't like it, well, then you can join the family of God too. No one's stopping you from doing that. Otherwise, stay out of family business. Brotherhood is a relationship that we can all enjoy within the church. And that's why I really hate to see it when, when Christians are hit and miss with church attendance. As we have so many things to be accomplished. So many things that we can enjoy together in the fellowship of saints. And we work very hard in our ministry trying to create different events providing different opportunities for us to grow as Christians and to enjoy good Christian fellowship. And growing in the faith is so much easier when you're here and participating and contributing in some way to the many functions that we sponsor here at the church. And it's fun. Besides all that, it's fun. We enjoy it. I'm sorry if I sound like I'm complaining uh, I actually had a similar conversation with one of my brothers in California not too long ago. I told him, you know, I regretted not being around. I miss him, you know, and all that, and how much I would love to have him closer so we can do more stuff together. He's my brother, so I guess I could say that. Oh, wait, you're my brothers and sisters. I could say that to you. I miss you. Not you guys, because you're here. But you on the radio, I miss you. Where are you? I miss your face. Brotherhood is a privilege, one that should be enjoyed, not ignored. Secondly, he's a worker. Synergos. Synergos is the Greek word. It's where we get the English word synergy. Synergy, interesting, right? And the idea, of course, is that two or more co-laborers will produce a far better product if they work together. That's the idea. Solomon said two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Paul, seeing this partnership with Epaphroditus, thought that it was a beneficial one. It was a fruitful one. It was one that was working out well, producing good results, fruitfulness. Now that's the type of team that we all want to build for ourselves. We all want to build that kind of team for our ministries. And I've been in the ministry a long time, probably 35 years or more in different levels. And in that time, I've even spent time on the mission field. And I've seen what happens when the wrong people are paired up together. Oh, it can be ugly. 
and miserably draining at the same time. We shouldn't assume that because we're Christians that all people can or should work well together. That is probably a bad assumption. Some people can and some people just can't. In the book of Acts, in chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas, of course, the classic story, they seemed to work well together as a team. But when they added John Mark, suddenly the team disintegrated. What happened? The problem wasn't necessarily between Saul and Barnabas. They got along just fine. So it must have been with John Mark. Yet John Mark was able to work well with Barnabas. So maybe the problem was with Paul. Who was at fault? Or maybe it's just the way God wanted it. Maybe it's just what God allowed to happen as we know how it all wound up. Now there are two ministry teams instead of one. So maybe that's what God wanted. And such things are simply going to happen. We don't know why. We don't always have to blame someone. It's best not to point fingers in such situations, though it is so human. And it is so natural. We want to find blame. We want to put the blame on this person or that person because they did this or they said that or they didn't do this when they should have. And we want to, we want to tear someone down because we've had a conflict. But we need to just simply keep silent and watch what the Lord will do with it. If you can make amends, certainly by all means make amends. But there are some people we're just not going to be able to work side by side with, get used to it. So that's just, just human of us. Epaphroditus was a perfect fit to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And I imagine that Paul was sensing some regret in that he had to send him home. I doubt that Paul was happy about that. In fact, uh, the fact that Paul calls him a worker tells us that there is simply a lot of work to do. And there's always plenty of need for more workers. Always we need more laborers to do the work. Even Jesus admitted that in Mark chapter 9. He said the harvest is great, but the workers are few. We just don't have enough. There's so much that could be done. We don't have enough people to do it. So I think I personally at least can appreciate, through all my years of, of experience in the ministry, I can appreciate what Paul is feeling here in this situation. What I mean by that is I hate losing people. And I especially hate losing good people. The bad ones I don't mind. The good people, the ones who work well, the ones who work well with me in the ministry. And I've had many good workers in the past, and we've enjoyed excellent synergy. But eventually, they leave. They have to leave for whatever reason. And we have to let them go, even the good ones. We have to let them go. Perhaps they're called home, they're called by their sending church, things have to change, their job transfers them, uh, the family needs them in a different state, their finances run out, an illness takes them out of the work, and they need to move on. But that's what we do in the ministry. We are equipping. We are constantly equipping. It's not like we equip and then we're finished. We have to constantly be equipping because in a healthy church, we should have young believers and we should have mature believers and we should have everything in between. And they are all at different stages of development and ministry. When the mature become so mature that they can go out and do their own thing, they must and they should. And everything in between is going to constantly be growing. And it's, it's, it's like the human body. I was told somewhere, and I don't know if, if, if it's absolutely true, maybe some of you medical people can tell me, the human body replaces its cells every seven years. That's an amazing thing when you think about it, and especially when you contrast it to what the Scripture says about the church being like the body of Christ. It seems that we're supposed to be replacing ourselves all the time with fresh cells, if you will, and the sense that we're, we're, we're needing to, to constantly develop new ministers and sending them, sending them out to do the work. That's the ministry of the Christian church, Ephesians 4. Textbook, classic. So Jesus in Matthew 9 said, Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest 
and ask him to send more workers into his field. And I urge you today to pray and to ask the Lord to make you one of his field hands, to make you one of his workers. And ask yourself today if you are working for the harvest of the Lord or if you're doing enough for the harvest of the Lord. Can you be doing more work for his harvest? And that's what you need to ask yourself. And it's, it's what we're training for. That's, it's what we're all training for. It's what our ministry is for, is so, that, so that we can have effective, fruitful Christian lives. Fruitful is important. And so pray to be used in some way, because we certainly need more workers to get more work done. Thirdly, Paul called him a soldier, a soldier. Sistratiotes in the uh, Greek language, which means a fellow soldier, but it can mean a companion in labors and conflict, and in particular, in this case, for the cause of Christ. And what I suppose that means is that there's nothing better than having someone by your side to help you in the fights that you're going to face and the struggles of the ministry. It's wonderful that you're not alone. That's the idea. And I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that the view from the pew is that the ministry is a pretty cush job. I'm sure that, you know, we do it so well, I'm sure, that it looks so easy, right? There's no real struggles to speak of. You know, the pastors are always loved. I'm sure that some of you have the impression that uh, your pastors live vacation lifestyles with no real cares, no real obligations. You know, how hard could it be to show up once a week, do your job? Be honest, you've thought it. But your impression, of course, would be incorrect. We are all very, very busy people, and, and we're often rewarded with longer days and nights. We're often rewarded with disappointment and criticism. We're often rewarded with complaints, with crisis, loneliness, frustration, and even worse. And I have to be honest with you, I am not complaining about it. it sounds like I am, but I'm not. I'm happy to live this life. I would not see myself, could not see myself doing anything else. I only mention these things simply to say how nice it is to have fellow soldiers who want to, well, stick their necks in the noose with me. That's the point. To have someone say, I'll, I'll do this with you. I'll, I'll, stay, I'll stay through the night. I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. You go home, get a little rest, and I'll take it from here. Oh, there's nothing better than to have someone like that because true ministry, real, genuine ministry, people ministry is just not easy. And the fact that he uses the word soldier should warn us that there's a battle afoot. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians 7, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. He thought he was going on vacation. There's no rest for us in Macedonia. We faced conflict from, the very, from, from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. That's the ministry. That's constant ministry. That's when ministry, that's when you know you are in the heart of where the Lord wants you to be because there's going to be battles. It's not a battle against flesh and blood, though humankind is almost always involved in it. The devil is constantly trying to, to instigate trouble within the church, pitting people against people and, and causing division and rifts and hard feelings and every other bad thing. And he's looking, trying to recruit people who will work for him and trying to stir up this trouble, trying to create this discord and cause the division. Peter warned that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour and so we need to be aware of his strategy and not be guilty of doing his work. And fourthly, Paul called Epaphroditus a messenger. And the word messenger in Greek, apostolos. It's the same word, apostle. He calls Epaphroditus an apostle, but an apostle simply means to be a delegate or one who is sent as an emissary or an ambassador. And if you notice how Paul worded it, I considered it necessary to send to you 
Epaphroditus, my brother, but your messenger. Your messenger. You sent him out. In other words, it's not as if the Lord called him to be the apostle, one of the twelve. But the church designated him as the apostle, the one who was sent out. Today, we would just call these missionaries. And this is why we believe that Epaphroditus was a missionary. He was an apostle. An apostle is really a missionary in today's world. In today's world, a missionary is apostolos, sent out. And he's sent out because he's usually sent to do a specific or a special function. His role, in, in our day anyway, is often to plant a church or to assist in planting a church or to somehow be involved in the special work of reaching beyond the doors or the walls of the local church. We want to do more. Mission work is outreach work. It's always sending, always out. Missionaries can serve long-term. They can serve short-term. And I think Epaphroditus was a short-term missionary. Paul was the long-term missionary while Epaphroditus was sent out to help him short-term. It may have been longer, except he got sick and he needed to come home. Today, with visa restrictions and other logistical reasons, a missionary is often or usually short-term, though we have many long-term missionaries that we know of that have gone from America and are serving in other parts of the country and doing great things in foreign lands for the kingdom's sake. And it sounds exciting, it sounds exotic, but it too is so very, very difficult. A missionary needs to be prepared to be away from home, from family, from the comforts of home. A missionary must be prepared to confront the great enemies of of discouragement and loneliness, two huge enemies that a missionary will face. As discouragement often approaches him on two fronts, Discouragement from the field. What I mean is this uphill struggle of trying to reach an unreached and an unwilling people group. Then there's the discouragement from the home front, which often comes from trying to convince your sending church that what you're actually doing out there is worth the money and the time and the effort that you're putting into sending me out there. And a lot of churches don't have that vision, and so they they often have difficulty getting behind the work. But there is a second enemy which must be addressed, and I've already called it loneliness. And often, a sending church will suffer from out-of-sight, out-of-mind syndrome. That goes without saying, I'm sure you understand what that means. And it doesn't take long for a sending church to forget that they've sent someone out, one of their own. And a missionary often finds himself alone very quickly. A missionary needs to be confident of his calling and cognizant of the presence of God. You need to know you're called because it's going to be tough. And you need to learn that God is with you and experience that life in the ministry, that regardless whether there are people who are going to answer your call or not, God is with you. Loneliness has crushed many a missionaries. In fact, the Apostle Paul may have exposed this enemy of loneliness in our text. In verse 26, speaking of Epaphroditus, since he was longing for you all. You see that longing, that loneliness, that longing for you all, and was distressed because you had heard he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him also, but also on, uh, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. That would have been terrible had he died, is what he's saying. But was Epaphroditus homesick? Was he sensing this loneliness? He was longing for you. Who? You back there at home. He was longing for the people at home. And so very often... A card, a note, an email, a Facebook post. Something, something as simple as that can mean so much to a missionary overseas or working in the field. Some of you may not uh, have, uh, 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 may not know what sort of ministry you, you should be involved in. That would be a good one, to stay in touch with missionaries. And finally, it says he's a minister. Uh, Liturgos is the Greek word, refers to a priest's service. 
Our English word liturgy comes from this word. It refers really to a priest's public order of service, but in particular how a priest or minister performs that service. So Paul is simply saying Epaphroditus did his job well. He was good at it. It was his priestly duty, and by calling it a priestly duty, he's elevating it to a very high position. It's a high calling when he says it that way. What Epaphroditus did for me was exceptional, and it was spiritual. It was an offering from God. That's what the priest does. He takes care of the offerings. He says, this was an offering from God. Thank you for that. Paul said in verse 28, Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Hold them up there. Respect them. Because for the work of Christ, Epaphroditus came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Paul wasn't complaining that they weren't doing enough. What he was saying is what you sent was wonderful, but there was still some need, and Epaphroditus met that need. Thank you for both. Thank you for the financial need, and thank you for Epaphroditus. He did, he did great. And so now he's telling them, give him a hero's welcome when he comes home. And think about it. When Paul and Barnabas had their breakup over John Mark, well, John Mark was no hero. He wasn't considered a hero at all. He was considered a failure because the great apostle Paul was really upset with him for, for messing up the team. And he had a difficult time being received back into the fellowship. Well, Paul didn't want the same thing happening at the church. Uh, they didn't want, he didn't want uh, Epaphroditus' church to have the wrong idea concerning him. And so he writes this, this glowing report, very good report to his supporters, and simply says, receive him, welcome him in. Don't treat him poorly. And as I said earlier, the ministry can be very difficult. I'd like to read to you what Paul wrote to Timothy in what is believed to be Paul's final words, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and listen to these words of loneliness. Listen to the discouragement in his voice, to the despair, and how Paul needed, in a sense, to encourage himself in this uh, hour of desperation that he finds himself. This is the, the, the idea of, of good self-talk. You talk to yourself the right way. The feelings were telling him one thing, but he took the truth of Scripture and put those feelings in their proper place. Very important lesson. Listen, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 9. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. And Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. That's the author Luke, Dr. Luke. Bring Mark with you. Mark? That's John Mark. So when they had the division, now Paul is saying, I want him, send him back. For he says, uh, bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. So they made up. I sent Tychicus to uh, Ephesus. When you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus at Troas. Also bring my books, especially my papers. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death, yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Do you see the depth of spirituality in those words? Now, I have seen myself I read these words and I shiver I've been in similar 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 situations I've spent hours and days in in in, in ministry 
And I wouldn't for a moment dare to say that I've suffered as the Apostle Paul suffered or in the same way. Not many ministers today would ever dare say that because we haven't. But I do know what it's like to feel alone, to feel abandonment in the ministry. I know what that's like. There were times when I lived in Austria that I wondered if anyone back home in the USA was praying for me at all. I wondered if they were thinking about me. Was, was there a concern at all for my well-being or for my success? But thankfully, I had my wife, my kids with me. But it was even worse for her, since she felt more alone than I did because I was always too busy trying to be successful. I know what it's like to experience discouragement. I know how hard it is to break through cultural barriers in New Jersey. <laughs> Fooled you. <laughs> I got to be honest with you, had I not tried to break through the barrier, the cultural barriers of Austria six years prior to that, for six years prior to that, I probably would have been so discouraged in New Jersey, I wouldn't have stayed. Because it's different here. Your folks are different. I've grown to like you, but you were different when I first got here. When we lived in Europe, we were the foreigners. We were the minority. We were the aliens. And uh, we were legal aliens, barely. But that still didn't make us feel welcomed, it didn't make us feel wanted, and it certainly did not make us feel needed. We knew we were needed because the Lord sent us there. This we were sure. But the Austrians didn't feel the same way. The Germans didn't care. The Italians certainly didn't care. None of them cared what we were there to do. The locals didn't want to listen to us. They didn't appreciate our religious convictions. We were known as the cult. We weren't religious people in the sense that they would understand it. In fact, I think we saw more fruit after we left than while we were there. I don't think so. I know so. That's how discouraging it was living in that land. And it was such a beautiful land. I also know what it's like to have people speak against you have intentions to harm you and to harm your ministry. Believe it or not, it's a very common thing in the ministry. I don't know that you ever get used to it. You don't, but you do expect it. It's part of the ministry. In fact, every great leader of Scripture had to deal with it. Think about it. Noah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Daniel, Jesus, Paul, all of them had their critics, yet did their jobs as unto the Lord. And if we're going to serve the Lord correctly, then we will have our critics too, yet we must continue to be committed to what the Lord has called us to. Epaphroditus was so committed that he nearly worked himself to death, and that's what makes him consummate missionary he left it all on the mission field he left it all there and that's the kind of minister I want to be that's the kind of minister I want to serve with I want that type of minister serving next to me and I believe that's the kind of minister the Lord is looking for but I doubt that Epaphroditus started out as a consummate missionary I think he started out as a Christian and he may have become the consummate missionary, but he had to start somewhere. And he had to start by taking the first step. For some of you, that first step is giving your heart to Jesus Christ and becoming a Christian. But for others, what I'm suggesting today is that you take the first step in, in serving him and finding somewhere to begin serving the Lord. And if you don't know where to begin, then I'm asking you to pray and ask God to show you where he wants you to begin. But in the meantime, you can probably volunteer to serve in, in the nursery once a month or in our children's ministry somewhere. 
You can cook meals for the meals ministry. You can bring in canned food for the soup kitchen or for the food pantry. There's so many things that you could do. You could sign up for Gunther's newsletter and his updates. You could be a part of his prayer team. You can write him letters every month or, or every two months or whatever you have time for. But you don't have to start by eating bugs in Africa. There's a lot of, there's a lot of steps between, between the first step and bugs in Africa. There's a lot of steps in between. Epaphroditus nearly killed himself serving Jesus Christ. Epaphroditus nearly killed himself serving Jesus Christ. Epaphroditus nearly killed himself serving Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? If you're not a Christian, aren't you tired of living for yourself? If you are a Christian, I'm praying you will be tired of living for yourself. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for every one of us that are gathered here in this place today, and you have given to us a, an example, a consummate missionary by the name of Epaphroditus as our example, and of course, even Epaphroditus leads us to Christ. As we look at his life, he leads us to the Savior, and he, he causes us to realize how we have fallen short and how there is such great need all around us. So use us, Lord. Use us. When we see our shortcomings, help us to run to you. If he is the example, we are still learning to catch up to that example. So help us. And, and more grace, Lord. More grace in our shortcomings. More grace. Because we can't do the things that we know we're supposed to do. Help us to find that grace. And keep prodding us, Lord. Keep urging us and cheering us on toward the finish line, that we would run the race with joy and run it with success. Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ, I pray you will speak to their heart about this wonderful life we call Christianity. More than that, it's not about being a Christian. It's about knowing the Savior Christ. I pray that we would be able to, to e explain Christ the best of our ability. If you're here today without faith in Jesus Christ, let me just say, he came to this world as a man. He lived a life of perfection on this earth. He died a sinner's death, but not for himself. But he died for our sins. He was buried rose from the dead as if to say, I am God, I am the Messiah. I have power over death, I have power over life. And now you can believe it or not. And he's asking you to believe. Believe. And then he'll show you what it all means. Believe. Believe in Jesus Christ. Tell him right now, Lord, I choose to believe the story about you. I choose to believe that it is true, and I believe that you will forgive me of my sins. So I come to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.